Okay, well, we'll make a start. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, I think tonight we are um, told we have 800 people registered, which is a great um, roll up. Um, I don't think we've got quite that many number online at the moment, but um, people will come in. And, and of course, these webinars are recorded and can be watched later on. So for those who, are, who um, I haven't been in a webinar with before, my name's John McKillop. I'm the independent chair of the Red Meat Advisory Council, and I've been chairing the um, industry task force on lumpy skin disease, foot and mouth disease for the last year. Um, just to refresh, we formed this group uh, back in April last year, initially to look at the um, the impact of lumpy skin disease and, and how we would cope with that. And of course, not long after that came along foot and mouth disease. Um, so it's been a great collaboration where we've worked, um, Red Med Advisory Council has worked very closely with NFF, as well as other industry bodies that have come into it, such as Dairy Australia, which are um, obviously under risk. And then once foot and mouth disease came in, obviously we went to um, the wool producers <clears throat> and to pork as well. So it's been a really good example um, of industries working together. But what's been really pleasing for me and for the rest of the industry is to see how well we've all worked with government as well. Um, there's been a great lot of collaboration, um, initially with um, Chris Parker, who many of you would know, but um, now uh, assisted by Brand Smith. So um, I think there's been a lot of work being done. Um, and the reason we've taken our foot off the accelerator in terms of running webinars and holding um, industry task force is largely because uh, a lot of the work has been done, not because we think there's that much less threat of either of those diseases coming in. So, um, you know, we're still very much of be alert, but not alarmed about the the uh, impact or the potential for those diseases to come in, as well as obviously the impact if they did come into Australia. So we've got a very good lineup tonight um, of speakers. Brad Smith is the um, Assistant Secretary for Animal Division Biosecurity. We've got Beth Cookson, who's known to most of you, um, Deputy um, Chief Veterinary Officer, and um, and then Brendan Cowell, from, who's the Executive Director of Ausbet. Um, so I won't take too much of your time because um, I'm the only one here without a degree in veterinary science. So I'm going to pass over to those who actually know what they're talking about. And I'll start with, um, with uh, Brant first. Great, thanks, John. I'll just uh, try and share my screen. Or the prezzo because you've got to have a prezzo. Has that come up now? Yes. Beautiful. So look, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak this evening about lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth disease, uh, particularly the situation in Indonesia and the, the recent modelling work that's commissioned by the Australian government. So um, ably um, joined by by Beth and Brendan, who I've, I've known for some time, um, deeply respect, and I'm really pleased that they're here far smarter than me, which is great. Um, so this webinar, as I think John has said, is a really great example of industry uh, and government working together. Um, Chris has been forging the way on that in recent times, um, and we did joke offline, I'm, I might be a sidekick, but I'm, I'm certainly equally passionate about this space too. And just a reminder from the department's perspective, why we're all here is a more sustainable and prosperous Australia through biosecurity production and trade. And I think that's why it's really important for us to keep our eye on that ball. All right, I'll try to the next, I'll try to go to the next slide. We'll see how we go. Okay, so I mean, it seems obvious for folks, but it's also worthwhile reminding ourselves the role that biosecurity plays in maintaining and or minimising, I guess, the risk of exotic pests and animals, animal diseases from entering Australia. We've talked a bit about the shared responsibility. We've talked a bit about what this all means, but these are real and present issues, and it's not each and of themselves that's the issue. It's, it's the culmination of all of these things coming together uh, and what that means for all of us. There's no doubt for us climate change is having a big impact on the on the environment with changes in weather patterns, uh, more extreme weather events, which alters habitat, range and distribution of pests and weeds and diseases, as well as the ability to spread and establish into new areas, which is really important. Um, decreasing biodiversity is also really important, driven by a lot of invasive species. Um, climate change, changing land use can weaken the resilience of ecosystems to future outbreaks. One thing that's been really important is around the, the shifting trade and, and travel patterns as well. 
uh, and we've seen Australia's supply chains, trading partners, demand for goods uh, continuously evolving and increasing in complexity. Uh, and this changes the, the biosecurity risks in, in you know, reaching our international and domestic borders um, and impacting on, on how we work with trading partners and each other. So, so changing land use, I know we've talked about this before, but that real interface between urban and non-urban areas and the environment has been really important. Um, and as our population grows and spreads and, and, and movements of people, wildlife, natural habitats and corridors with agricultural area, that is increasing our biosecurity risk. Another thing that's been really prevalent is the illegal activity, and that has increased in recent years. Those would have seen the news, would have seen the 38 tonnes of, of illegally imported uh, animal products that was um, stopped or at least found um, in, in Sydney, which, which I and many other colleagues in the department were heavily involved in. This is leading to higher biosecurity threats and needs to, and the need for us to be ever vigilant um, is certainly there. Major global disruptions such as COVID-19 obviously can shock supply chains and impact the movement of goods and people, but that's still washing through the system, right? So that sort of um, issue around movements of, of you know, cars, for instance, we've seen a whole lot of those issues around contamination of, um, of cars and, and the, the issues there where, you know, trading partners were having issues around where they would store those cars, they were having more, more sort of exposure to pests and, and, um, and potentially other um, biosecurity matter, and then that gets shipped to our shores and then we have to deal with it. So those sorts of things are really putting strains on our system. Um, and obviously the ever, you know, increasing biosecurity risks that we see overseas, for example, up his skin disease and foot and mouth disease outbreaks, which we will discuss um, tonight. And we all know why it's really important to have, um, you know, that the, the um, um, freedom from a whole lot of these diseases and pests because of the, the status that it has for our trading and market access uh, as we go forward. So it is really important that that everybody understands these um, sorts of things, but that we also have a, a key role to play. Now, we've, we've sort of shown this before. These are the sort of classic slides of foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, but it is, is worthwhile mentioning um, again that one of the things that will be really important is particularly for producers and farmers and, and folks is that suspicious signs of foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease are most likely going to be found by people on the ground. And so it's really important that, that they report any sort of unusual findings to our EAD hotline. And I've put that number up a number of times. I'm happy to do it again. But there is a 1-800 number, 1-800-675-888. I've got it in my phone. I've tested it. It works. You ring folks. And it can just be about having a discussion about what you see out there. You know, it might not be as obvious as something like this. It could be a shift in lameness. It could be whatever. But if you're not sure, you're better off having a false alarm ringing, having a chat to a vet, having them come and have a look, or might not, and, and then go from there than, than, than leaving something and finding that it's spread to 30 premises or, or, or properties, and then we're really in a bit of a pickle. So in the UK, those, those, um, uh, disease outbreaks of foot and mouth had spread to multiple premises before anyone found out. Uh, and by that time, it makes containment and eradication much, much harder. So if you're not sure, have a have a discussion with some, some folks that know what they're dealing with uh, and, and you can go from there. It's a no faults process. So it's really important that people get out there and have a look. These are the sorts of things you might might see. And some of these things are hard to distinguish between some of the diseases we have here. When, when we're talking about swollen limbs or you know fever or watery eyes, clearly when you've got big lumps all over an animal, it might be a bit different. But some of the signs are particularly challenging to, to um, discern, discern between different diseases. So let's look at the current sort of situation um, here. So as you can see, the darker areas have got more cases, the lighter areas have, have less cases. So this illustrates the distribution of, of foot and mouth cases reported in Indonesia. And, as you can see, most of the cases this year have been prompt, you know, predominantly in Java and Sulawesi. So as of yesterday, um, the Indonesian government had reported a total of 610,399 FMD cases uh, since the outbreak began, uh, and cases are reported in 27 of 38 provinces. On the LSD front, um, this illustrates the distribution of LSD cases in Indonesia um, on their official website. 
as you can see, most cases reported this year have been on the island of Java. Um, and as of yesterday, the numbers are a total of 38,169 since the outbreak began. Um, but it would be fair to say the true extent is probably unclear. Um, it's likely that these cases numbers have been underreported. Um, most of the focus has, has certainly been on foot and mouth disease, and there are some challenges that they face um, in inter country about um, how they report and, and um, um, notify cases. So I guess you know Indonesia is mounting a, a um, important response um, to both foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease. Um, and the government is providing assistance to Indonesian only neighbours and Beth's going to go into a bit of detail about how they are supporting uh, Indonesia in the next presentation. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but, su but suffice to say they are, they have been putting in considerable effort. They do have a lot of challenges. You know, there's 11,000 islands, there's 38 provinces, a whole bunch of provincial politics and issues, uh, and they don't have a, a sort of a you know, a centralised form of, of government like we do in the Department of Ag. They have disaggregated means of dealing with quarantine and the like. So it has been very challenging for them. Um, and there's also some other challenges too around the fact that um, areas have got different degrees of vaccination rates and the like um, for, you know, reasons that are very hard for us to get our heads around. But we've been very ably supported by industry uh, and the intel we get on the ground from them has been fantastic. Uh, we've also got our councillors and posts overseas. So it really has been uh, an important sort of collaborative effort to find out what's happening on the ground and where we can direct our efforts as well. One of the things that um, has come up um, is around these reports of um, Indonesia planning to declare um, FMD endemic. So I guess I just want to sort of um, deal with that directly. This does not mean in any way that they're sort of giving up their ghost. You know, you know, it, it just means that, as we understand it, and I know it's still early, um, that they are they're not stopping controlling the disease. They're just preparing to transition it from what's an emergency phase to a longer term management of, of foot and mouth disease. So there has been a recent decree from the Minister of Agriculture, which indicates that control of foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease still remains a priority. Um, their surveillance, their biosecurity, vaccinations, movement controls will all continue to be implemented. Um, they do have a roadmap for, um, you know, 2030 eradication, which they're still working towards. There's going to be a considerable effort required to get there. Um, and, you know, we will continue to provide support to Indonesia as, as we need to help them in their, in their efforts. But the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that we've got very strong measures. We've had them in place for this period of time. They've been successful. You know, FMD has been around for 100 years um, and we we have, you know, you know, stock and uh, are people coming in and out of, of FMD countries and products um, for uh, many, many years. And we've had got 70 countries. So I guess I want people to realise that we're still taking this very seriously. We've still got the measures in place to manage that, but it's not to to sort of, you know, raise concerns. It wasn't unexpected. We, we thought this might be the case. We prepared as such. Uh, and therefore, we, we're confident that we've got all of our, our settings in place to manage that risk. I know it sort of came out of, out of the blue a little um, as far as the announcement goes, but it wasn't unexpected from the from the department's um, view, uh, and we think we can manage it going forward. I'll just quickly touch back on the Nut Lumpy Skin Disease Action Plan. We had some terrific engagement from industry um, on the development of this, and I think this is a great example of how collaboration comes together in the form of, of our first action plan for lumpy skin disease. Um, we obviously, um, this was released last year in October with the minister, well received. Um, we had some folks come along to that. Uh, and since then, we've released our first progress report on our website. And of the 27 activities, 22 are underway, uh, and it's showing really good engagement and, and I guess implementation. So um, that's been overseen by uh, uh, an industry government steering committee under the animal plan. And that formally reports up to the National Biosecurity Committee. So it has a, a lot of um, oversight, um, but also we're starting to get, get along and kick goals in that space as well. So I'm just really pleased that that's, that's been um, a really good success. So I won't touch on much of this because this is the, this is the space that Brendan's going to touch on. Um, but this was one of the, the activities um, identified uh, in the Lumpy Skin Disease Action Plan involved undertaking this risk mapping of the likelihood of entry establishment and spread of LSD to, to inform surveillance and preparedness um, activities. So 
One of the things we were wanting to look at is non-regulated pathways. So regulated pathways come in through imported goods. Um, non-regulated pathways come in th through other means, so on vessels and, and, and the like, or windborne um, spread into the country. So what this has given us is some really useful information around some of those entry points, some of the risks, um, and I'm sure that, that Brendan can go through that in detail because he'll he'll talk about it much more meaningfully than myself. I guess the key for us, and, and uh, John has, has, has stolen my thunder, uh, around the be alert but not alarmed. One of the things for us is that it is really important that we continue to maintain our focus. I know the sort of, you know, the hump of the disease, um, I guess, has, has passed as far as the, the, the epi curve, but it's still going to be a long tail. There's still going to be disease around for some time. Um, and and I, seem, I say to a lot of folks, the more you can do in peacetime, uh, the better you can, you, you will be, uh, if in the event, God forbid, that we got a, an outbreak. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to um, industry folks, um, and one of the things we, we talk a lot about is not just your on-farm biosecurity planning that the producers and other sh people should have. Um, it's about what do you do as, as producers, as sectors, um, to come together um, now to do the sort of work that needs to be done. Because once the gun fires um, metaphorically on this, it's going to be all on, and it's going to be fast, and it's going to be um, pretty, pretty uh, challenging. So, you know, everyone's heard about for foot and mouth disease, or, you know, the, the national standstills and the like, and that's true. Um, but the reality is, is we've got our OSVET plans, we've got our enterprise manuals, we've got very good processes in place to help us, but it's going to require a lot of really good communication, really good collaboration if we had to go through that process. And I say, I use the sort of fire, fire um, evacuation analogy a lot, but I'll, I'll reiterate that again. You don't want to be testing that the first time when you have a fire in the building. You want to have your plans in place, you want to have tested them, you want to test them again, you want to improve them, and you want to make sure that there aren't any gaps in what, what, you, what you're doing. Because it's not just about exotic diseases like foot and mouth, there'll be others. Um, there'll be you know other diseases that pop up, and the more we can better understand what biosecurity means in different settings, different industries, intensive, non-intensive industries, the better we will be and then how we can all work together. Because we have blunt tools around legislation and standstills and the like, but ultimately how industry and how folks can come together um, in peacetime and talk about what it means and how they can you know, maintain the viability of their industry as best they can with those constraints, the better we will all be. And because a lot of that will need to come from on the ground around what, what needs to happen. And so I've, I've got on there the emergency animal disease hotline I really want to encourage people to, to put that in. Uh, and again, the, the messages for us, put that into your phone, um, is that a false alarm is far better than waiting. So there, it's not going to be a case of, you know, you ring the hotline and then suddenly helicopters circle and people in white suits come out and put a tape around your property or whatever it looks like. What it could be is a really important conversation. You know, it could be to say, well, I've got this, these cases. I'm not sure what they are. We'll come out and have a look. No, we don't think it is. We'll take some samples, off we go. It could be something simple like that. But it is really important that people are being vigilant and they are keeping records of what, you know, because tracing for us is really important in the event of an outbreak. All those good practices, there's lots of good information on, on um, um, farmbiosecurity.com.au. Lots of help out there for people to start thinking about that now. Um, and then if you need any sort of further advice or help on that, then obviously you can come to the department or, or through your local um, vets or producers or whatever that looks like um, to, to get some help. So I'm going to um, just pause there. I guess I just really wanted to say um, a, a thanks very much to, to NFF and um, for inviting us here today. Um, NFF is a particularly important partner uh, with us. Um, and I know we, we, we talk about the, the um, uh, strength of industry and the like, but without, without having them and ourselves joined up in this space, it, it would not provide the confidence that, that people on the ground have. So I just wanted to make a big thank you there. Uh, and that, that the, the diligence and the discipline we all need to face on exotic pests and diseases um, is never more important than now. So just wanted to end that note on that, that yes, it is an important shared responsibility and what we're all doing it for Australian agriculture. So really wanted to thank um, you for your time and, and happy to take questions now or down the track. Back to you, John. You're on mute, John. Brad, thank you for that.
um, very comprehensive and um, and good to get that update. Um, we will take questions at the end, um, so if people can just uh, send any questions through. I meant to say that uh, at the start, my apologies. Um, and we'll try and collate those questions as best we can. I see we've got 231 people online. Um, so we'll try and collate those into, into themes and answer those as best we can. But again, um, I just want to reiterate Brant's thoughts there. Get that number, that 1800 number in your phone. Um, if you never use it, that's a really good thing, but it's there. 1-800-675-888. Okay, uh, our next speaker is um, well known to most people. Beth, Beth spends a lot of time up in Indonesia um, as the chief uh, deputy um, chief veterinary officer. So I'll hand over to Beth to take us through her presentation. Thanks, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just checking, can you see that presentation now? Is that up for you, John? Yes. yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I actually wasn't going to have slides this evening, but then I learned that Brandt had slides and I thought I might as well have slides. Um, but they're mostly pictures, so um, I hope you'll, um, I hope you forgive me. Um, as John mentioned, um, I uh, have been spending quite a lot of time uh, in the region. I actually work uh, out of far north Queensland and tonight I join you from um, Jabagai country um, up just outside of, of Cairns. Um, and really what I want to talk about uh, tonight is where things have moved uh, over the last uh, 12 plus months. Um, it seems a long time ago, March 2022 and then May 2022, but I think the, you know, the, the six and or so months that followed that, um, you know, really drew industry uh, and government uh, and all of our community together in this story. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity now to sort of come and, and talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing to continue to support Indonesia um, to control foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Um, but I'll also talk just a little bit on um, some of our other regional biosecurity capability building activities um, and partnerships, uh, particularly with Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste, um, and then uh, touch briefly on North Australia because I can't help myself. Um, the Sorry, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. There we go. Um, and so I'm going to start with talking about the uh, collaboration that we've built with um, with Indonesia over this period. Um, so we've, we've spent a bit of time, and John and Grant have both reflected on how important the partnership with Australian industry has been, and I absolutely uh, ditto that. Uh, and, you know, in, in fact, that followed it through into some of the uh, initiatives that are underway uh, in Indonesia as we speak. Um, but the partnerships and the collaborations uh, have also extended into uh, that near region. Uh, and um, the early uh, supports were really around um, the provision of vaccines. And you would have seen the media um, with the 4 million doses that we provided of foot and mouth disease vaccine. Um, the initial 435,000 doses of lumpy skin disease vaccines um, with a commitment, uh, which is working to provide an, an additional million doses of, of lumpy skin disease vaccine to aid that uh, long-term um, response now. Um, but it's really become a lot deeper than that and we've worked very um, closely with our Indonesian counterparts to understand what those needs are um, and to make sure that uh, the support that Australia is able to provide is building that um, partnership that will, will that will take us through into those future stages of implementing Indonesia's foot and mouth disease roadmap um, and also supporting their lumpy skin disease implementation plan. Um, so one of the things we did uh, reasonably early on was to deploy a biosecurity counsellor um, into uh, our um, embassy in Jakarta and that was to uh, support the um, agricultural councillors who were already in country. Um, and I, I did want to just, um, you know, pay some respect to Dr. Donna Bennett, um, who contributed immensely um, during the, um, the, the time that she was posted to Jakarta. It really allowed us to establish a, a direct relationship into the Ministry of Agriculture um, to understand firsthand what was going on in terms of the response efforts and therefore to engage 
um, very deliberately around what was needed to support that response. Um, the support that's been provided to Indonesia has been provided um, through the department, um, as well as the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, through the Australian Indonesia Health Security Partnership, um, through the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness, um, and through the Australian industry organisations, um, uh, particularly LIFOR and uh, MLA. Um, we've also um, partnered with the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the United Nations, um, and we're working with their office in Indonesia at the moment on a um, project to continue to support um, Indonesia, um, and particularly the Ministry of Agriculture in their response to foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. And that will um, actually see a, a departmental um, officer seconded um, for the period of, of that project. So again, we'll have the direct in-country um, presence and opportunity to uh, work with those counterparts. Um, the foot and mouth disease um, and lumpy skin disease vaccination uh, campaign has also been supported by um, our opportunity to train vaccinators on the ground as well as communication and awareness materials. Um, and also through the provision of technical assistance. Um, and that's um, come in multiple different forms depending on the need at the time. Um, but one of the particular activities um, that would be um, worth mentioning is um, training of frontline biosecurity officers. Um, and we've actually uh, um, partnered there with um, Charles Sturt University um, who um, deliver our biosecurity training centre. Um, and they've worked with Indonesian counterparts to, um, on a um, needs analysis to identify what those needs are. Um, we've got a similar program that's just run with uh, Timor-Leste officials as well. Um, and we'll shortly have um, 10 uh, trainees from Indonesia attending that training facility in Wagga Wagga. Um, and so that's a really great example um, of the depth of that um, relationship and the support that we're able to provide to Indonesia at the moment. Um, we've also um, worked on the diagnostic um, side of, uh, of Indonesia's lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth disease response. Um, so uh, there we've uh, worked with the Australian Centre for Disease uh, preparedness on a regional emerging disease support program um, that's underway as we speak. Um, and pleasingly, that will also improve um, the interlinkages between the diagnostics and the surveillance system, um, which is called our sickness in, um, in Indonesia. Um, and our sickness is actually a legacy of a previous Australian government program uh, with Indonesia as well. Um, so it's really good to see all of these um, connections happening. Um, and um, the um, sustainable sort of programs of work um, in Indonesia. I've mentioned previously the industry-led initiatives. Um, so there are a couple of pro projects there that we've partnered with um, LifePore to support foot and mouth and lumpy skin vaccine purchases um, to subsidise vaccination of, of cattle going into Indonesian feedlots um, and also with MLA on a biosecurity support project. Um, so that's really supporting the, um, the close relationship um, that exists between um, Australian industry and Indonesian industry um, to grow knowledge and capacity at the ground level. So I think that gives a bit of a flavour um, of the um, nature of the activities that are now uh, well and truly um, in swing in Indonesia. Um, and of course, um, both uh, Dr. Mark Schiff and uh, myself, as well as the Minister, have spent time in Indonesia over the last 12 months um, to deepen that um, high level uh, engagement and, and continued commitment to Indonesia's response. Um, in terms of what we're doing in the near region, um, so we, we've got um, a, a program of work um, with Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea and also in the Pacific. Um, the history of our work with um, Timor Leste and, and PNG actually goes back 20 years. So we've got a really good um, foundation for um, that ability uh, for international engagement. Um, and the focus for the work uh, in Timor and, and Papua New Guinea has really been on um, their preparedness. Um, so, of course, Timor and Papua New Guinea, I should mention, uh, remain free of both foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Um, so we've undertaken work um, for example, with rapid risk assessments, 
um, for looking at uh, vaccine preparedness should they um, be required to respond, including cold chain. Um, we've mentioned um, previously the um, biosecurity capacity building and the image on the left there is actually of the, um, the Timor left a cohort that attended training in um, Wagga just recently in April. Um, and they've been also trained in, in training of the training technique. So they'll now go back under a mentorship program with Charles Sturt University um, and deliver that um, training and awareness to their colleagues in, in Timor. Um, we have also um, do collaborative animal health surveys uh, in both Timor and Papua New Guinea. There's one underway in Timor at the moment within the border areas with Indonesia and that's done um, by the um, Timorese Ministry of Agriculture um, with support from um, our officers. Um, and that, that's both an awareness as well as a set surveillance campaign. Um, and shortly there will be a similar activity in Papua New Guinea um, in the border areas uh, with Indonesia. So, and that's really about sort of providing awareness out to those communities and villages, um, but also making sure that um, diseases can be detected early. Um, we've also um, working in the um, Pacific, as I mentioned. Um, so we've got a strong program of engagement there. Um, and we've currently got three vet officers um, in the Solomon Islands um, participating in um, planning for um, a Solomon Islands Life Treaty Development Program that's uh, funded through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, and also working um, with those agencies to build local biosecurity capacity ahead of the 2023 South Pacific Games where there's expected to be a lot of movement in the region. And so that really gives a flavour, I guess, of the um, of the efforts um, pre-border, um, and that's been an important part of the Lumpy Skin Disease National Action Plan um, under Objective One. Um, and so briefly, just before I finish, because I know everyone's keen to um, get to Brendan's presentation about the risk assessment for Lumpy Skin Disease, I just wanted to touch um, briefly on Northern Australia, so as there were. Um, Australian government um, funding commitments in the October budget um, that saw some more coordination mechanisms set up and that was really to deepen um, the connections right through from um, the ground level, um, from, from producers, from communities, from um, industry participants across the supply chain through uh, state farming organisations, peak industry bodies um, and to government and this is really you know, strengthening that opportunity for um, us all to um, engage and um, strengthen the overall system. Um, Brant mentioned that biosecurity threats are becoming more frequent um, and the factors behind that. And of course, Northern Australia has um, some quite unique um, aspects of exposure to the unregulated pathways due to its proximity um, to countries to our near north as well as um, a very sort of expansive coastline, um, you know, high populations of wild roaming animals and low human population um, that means that detection um, can be uh, difficult. So, um, so there was a commitment to strengthen defences uh, in the north um, and there's a few things that we've been doing to do that. So um, I'll first mention the Northern Australia Biosecurity strategy which is a really important mechanism that brings together um, the Commonwealth with Queensland and TNWA governments to um, set as, as well as um, Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia um, and the National Indigenous Australians Agency um, to look at um, what those priorities are for biosecurity in the north and provide that overarching framework. Um, we also um, have established the Northern Australia Coordination Network, uh, which will deliver on the ground activities in partnership with key industry groups um, to provide information about emergency animal disease prevention and preparedness. Um, and that's, um, that's being led um, through a, a lead coordinator who's been appointed in the Northern Territory. And we've been really pleased to welcome Robbie Dalton to that role. Um, the industry and government coordinators are still being appointed in WA and Queensland, um, but that's a really a good opportunity um, to strengthen that engagement across the north. Um, and, um, and there was also the establishment of um, the 
northern office of the Australian Chief Sentencing Officer, which I'm really pleased to have been given the opportunity to head up. Um, and our work is focused on um, the pre-border pre and the region. Um, last slide, um, really just to get down to that practical level, um, Brandt mentioned about the importance of preparedness of uh, surveillance and early detection. So a big shout out to uh, NABSNET. The image on the left there is a group of um, private and government veterinarians who work across the north. Um, there's not many um, of them, of us. Um, and so joining up to understand what the priorities are to share uh, information and knowledge um, is really useful. Um, as is the work of the Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy, which focuses on surveillance and early detection in, in some of the very remote and um, unmanaged wild animal populations across the North. Um, so that sort of um, ex uh, extensive sort of network of surveillance officers, if, if you like, is really critical to um, to the work in the north and some of the things just for example um, that they're doing at the moment is um, focusing on um, investigating uh, skin lesions in animals that's post monsoon right so if there was going to be a, a period of time when um, you know there was a higher concern of lumpy skin disease arriving um, then it, it's during that period so the the work that Brendan will talk about next um, will be really sort of crucial for um, these types of operational groups to take into account um, when they're looking at the design of that surveillance activity, where they look, when. Um, and also, um, just as a final shout out to um, the preparedness activities going on across all of the northern jurisdictions. Um, and the image on the right is just of a recent one uh, in the Northern Territory, which was a, a, um, a desktop um, exercise to, to practice response exercises. And as Brant mentioned, uh, these are really important to do now. Um, so that we're well uh, versed and well practiced um, if we were to respond to the real thing. So I think I will uh, leave it there um, because I know we're all keen to get to Brendan's presentation and, and happy to come back for uh, any um, questions at the end. Great. Um, I think I'm Beth. Thanks, Beth. That was great presentation, great update, and great to see what's happening up in Indonesia because obviously that's the um, the front line, um, and certainly it was one of the groups that we formed at the start of this um, um, industry task force. Was you know, how do we work with the Indonesians to make sure that they do everything that they can to keep it at bay um, as much as they can? So that's great to have that update. Um, I also meant to mention, and remiss of me not to, is that we have Samantha Allen, um, who is the works very closely with the animal works organizes the emergency preparedness um so samantha's online for questions later on if anyone wants to pose questions directly to samantha then um or more generally just let us know and um, do it through the channels okay next um we have brendan callard who is as i said before is the um, executive director of osvet so looking forward to hearing um an update from osvet Thanks, John. Can you hear me and see my presentation? Yes, thank you. That's great, thanks. Well, I'll get straight into it. Um, right, today I'm going to talk about um, some work we did at Ausvet, um, investigating the likelihood that lumpy skin disease will blow into Northern Australia. Then we looked at other things as well. As um, Brant said before, we looked at other um, non-regulated pathways, such as shipping and Torres Strait treaty movements, um, cultural movements, but this was relatively a high risk um, airborne transmission. So that's what I'm gonna concentrate mostly on in this talk. Before I start, thanks um, National Farmers Federation for hosting um, me presenting today. Um, producers are at the heart of what OSVET does, so it's great to give you guys some objective information that you can use to make business decisions. Also, thanks to Department of Ag um, in Canberra for funding this research. Um, it was a great foresight to include this sort of work in their preparedness activities, um, so thank you. Also, thanks to my um, uh, colleagues um, who assisted in this um, scientific research, both from Ausvet and from the Department of Ag. So today I'd like to talk about the, the background of this project quickly. I'm going to talk about some methods that we took, and these methods are two things I'll concentrate on windborne modelling that we did and also what a risk assessment is so you can actually judge our work and see um, the, the, the flaws and foibles with this sort of approach. Um, I'll present some key findings and then the recommendations. Um, 
I don't think we'll have time to talk about climate change, but we did do some climate change research on this as well. So the background, uh, essentially SEBRA, Centre for Biosecurity Risk, Risk Analyses in Melbourne, um, Uni did some great research looking at um, what the risks of an outbreak might be over the next five years. This was a, 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 a like essentially a two hour workshop of experts to ask them what they thought, what their opinion was about an outbreak. And they said, look, we think it's a 28% chance of an outbreak of lumpy skin disease in the next five years. So that concentrated some minds and motivated Department of Ag to commission Ausvet to do some a, a really deep dive into the science and to do a risk assessment and see what we thought the actual science said about a, um, a, you know, an outbreak study in Northern Australia, for example, being blown across from Indonesia. So that was our, that was our um, we, we followed on from Cerebra. So our question really was to assume a situation where lumpy skin disease was endemic and present throughout Southeast Asia and PNG and, and, and say, look, how many lumpy skin disease that, um, incursions could we get into the north of Australia um, through these non-regulated pathways each year? And so these non-regulated pathways we looked at were windborne dispersal of arthropod vectors. That just means infected insects blowing into Australia. Um, we looked at commercial vessels, containers, we looked at live export vessels, and we looked at Torres Strait treaty movements. But as, but as I said, that windborne dispersal was a bit more significant than the others, so we concentrated most of our report and, and this presentation on that. So the bigger picture of what we actually did, we did a global science review. So we looked at the literature and the published scientific papers out there. We talked to experts from around the world and we talked to virologists. Um, in fact, the, the team had a virologist in it um, and we really understood lumpy skin disease um, in our approach. We then did a qualitative risk assessment where we just said, look, let's give us a, a bit of an idea about whether it might be a high risk or a low risk or a medium risk of coming into Northern Australia. Um, let's have a look at it that way. And then we took a really deep dive into the science and we did that quantitative risk assessment where we said, let's do maths, let's do probabilities and statistics, let's do some modelling and let's look at it that way. So that's our basic methodology. And now I'd like to take, take you through quickly what a risk assessment is. So risk assessments, are, it's a really a, a defined sort of scientific approach to asking risk, you know, and answering risk questions. So it's well supported by the sort of nearly all industries, including um, international bodies for animal health. It's a lot, you know, to, to do this, you say, what's a logical pathway that um, say an insect could blow into Australia and introduce infection? So you work out the pathway, um, and you say, what are the steps in that pathway? What are the logical steps? So, you know, if we're talking about windborne entry to Northern Australia, it would be that, you know, lumpy skin disease is present in a relevant area of Indonesia. There's cattle there. Enough of those cattle are infected. Those cattle are uh, bitten by biting insects. And then those insects blow across to Australia and they land in a relevant area of Australia where there's cattle or buffalo. And then they bite um, those cattle or buffalo and enough of them bite a cattle um, to start transmission going. So that's the that's the sort of approach we take. And then for each one of those steps, we say, well, what's the likelihood of this happening? And then you multiply those likelihoods down the pathway and you get a bit of an estimate um, at the end if, if it's a high or a low um, um, probability. And you also get uncertainty. Um, so each one of those steps has uncertainty and that uncertainty accumulates along the pathway to you, you, you get to the end answer. So that's a risk assessment. You got to understand what a risk assessment is to judge this work. So um, during our um, uh, deep dive into the science in our global science review, um, <clears throat> one common thing that came through was that a transmission of lumpy skin disease into Australia, into a cow, will probably not happen with a single insect. This is because these insects have, um, uh, the virus doesn't live inside these insects, it just lives on the outside of the insect, so there's not much virus. And it takes a certain amount of virus to start transmission going in cattle. And so most of the research around the world shows that you need 30 to 50 insects to land on one single animal and bite that animal about the same time to start infection going. So that's what the science tells us. We also said to ourselves, well, let's say it's only three, three four or five insects that's need, needed to blow in to start infection going. Let's look at that scenario. And then we said, well, let's say worst case scenario, the science doesn't support this, but let's say it's a single insect is required to start, um, you know, blow into Australia to start infection going if it bites a cow. Um, we think it's probably in here. Um, so there's been some recent 
work in 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 UK to suggest that maybe it's you know 15 or so insects might be required on one animal to start infection going, but we think the best estimates around there. So all our scenarios that we've got have these sort of results broken up into the 30 to 50 insects to the five, three to five insects and to a single insect. So there's a bit of uncertainty there. We also did some um, airborne modelling. So we used the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's high split model. Um, Deb Eagles from um, CSIRO um, did this with Blue Tongue a few years ago, and we've repeated pretty much the same methodology now for lumpy skin disease virus, um, where you actually model the distribution of um, particles across the atmosphere and you know release 10,000 um, uh, particles in Indonesia and see if it reaches Australia. So that's a really key step looking at one of those um, steps in that risk assessment chain I told you about. So here's the first bit of results. Um, so um, I'll talk you through these. Um, this middle panel here, um, where it says one from 286, uh, that's, that's, a, um, that's the three to five insects necessary to start an infection. In that panel there, that blue dot at the top um, indicates, um, based on our research, that you'd get an outbreak once every 286 years on average. Now those confidence intervals are quite wide, those little um, bars around that blue dot at the top of that um, panel. Um, that shows we're not quite certain um, and there's still some things to address with science to resolve that uncertainty, but it shows that it's not a very likelihood, um, high likelihood of a, um, an outbreak if it takes quite a few insects to start an outbreak. It's even less likely if it takes 30 to 50 insects. If it takes 30 to 50 insects landing on one animal, I mean, these insects have got to blow across in one little mob all the way from Indonesia. They've got to land on one animal to start infection. If, it, if that's the true scenario, then it, you, know, you can expect an outbreak every several thousand years. So it's not very common at all. However, if it's one insect that can cause um, infection, which the science doesn't support, but it, you know, there's always advances in science, but if it's one insect, then you can expect an outbreak every five to six years. We don't think that's likely. So they're the kind of results we're getting. We think the truth is somewhere in here, you know, an outbreak every few hundred years or a few thousand years. Um, we don't think it's a common event, but those confidence intervals are quite wide. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty in our estimates. And that's because each one of those steps in that risk assessment path has some uncertainty where further research is required to refine this estimate. So here's an example of some windborne dispersal um, modeling. So each one of those streams there is a simulation where we release particles, um, uh, not really releasing particles, but in the computer and looked at where they went. And you can see that the Northern Territory here is a key area um, where infection could be introduced. And we also found that using the weather patterns over the last five or 10 years, it's the monsoon, of course, where the risk period is high because that's where the winds are gonna be blowing into Northern Australia. So particularly December to April. So here's a, an example of one of those simulations. You can see what sort of particles are doing. Um, I'll repeat that a couple of times. Starts in uh, Indonesia and then um, blows across the territory. That's a pretty typical run of what we're simulating. Um, so that shows that the territory is a, a pretty key place to do surveillance. If we mapped out all those um, uh, simulations, you can see the territory is really important around Darwin, um, Coburg Peninsula, Van Diemen Gulf. Um, the Kimberley is also important and also the far north of Queensland if PNG or um, West Papua ever becomes infected. Um, and of course, in, during the monsoon. So that's where you do surveillance. So key research priorities, um, to make sure that we get some more certainty and we, those steps are better defined that, that form a risk assessment and you can get a, a more precise alert estimate, um, there's a few things to address. We need to make sure we answer the question, can a single insect um, lead to lumpy skin disease transmission? We don't think so. There's no evidence. There's been pen studies around the world. Um, we don't think it can happen, but keep our eye on this and make sure it can't. Can chilocoides actually transmit lumpy skin disease? Most of the research overseas shows that mosquitoes and big heavy flies like stable fly sort of flies are what spread um, lumpy skin disease. And you know, midges which do spread blue tongue haven't been shown to spread lumpy skin disease anywhere. Now they're a different insect. They can actually transmit quite easily into Northern Australia. So that would be a, a bit of a game changer if that was discovered that that could happen. Um, the other thing to think about is we, part, we model particles, um, but in actual fact, insects are not particles. 
there, um, there's something that's living. So can they survive in those high altitude wind streams? Um, and there's a heap more questions there to answer to make sure we get some more certainty over our risk assessment. Um, and these will be entomologists answering these questions largely, but um, I won't go through those now, um, but there's a heap more questions to answer. And so I guess in conclusion, we do have extreme uncertainty in our estimates. Those confidence intervals were wide, um, but they're particularly sensitive to the number of insects required to start a transmission event. Um, we think it's multiple insects. But having said that, an incursion appears to be much less likely than we previously thought over the last year or two. Um, and I guess and a good example of this is Sura. Sura is an infection that's found to our north throughout Southeast Asia, and it's been there for decades and decades. It's spread by very similar insects to lumpy skin disease virus, and it's never spread to Australia. There's a number of other plant diseases that are also spread um, throughout Southeast Asia, and they're also spread by insects like mosquitoes, the same things that spread lumpy skin disease, and they haven't spread either. So that's, that supports our risk assessment, I think. Um, having said that though, um, we do know insects could probably blow across from Indonesia, and we know that um, some of them will be infected. So if we're doing surveillance for insects, it's quite likely we'll see an infected insect being detected, say around Darwin, for example, one day. Um, that doesn't mean an outbreak's occurring, it means that an insect's blown across, but did enough insects blow across to land on one animal to start transmission happening? That's the question. I guess we've looked at um, comparative sites, um, so we need, you know, especially around Kimberley, Northern Territory, to look for this disease um, in the monsoon. Um, we've identified some research gaps that we need to address, but having said all that, I think continued vigilance um, is also required regardless. We've still got to prepare as if an outbreak would happen. You guys have still got to keep your eyes open um, for any outbreaks out there and report them as soon as you see them. So don't relax due to our research, but just be alert and not alarmed as Brent and um, John said before. Um, just be aware. Um, we don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. And that concludes my talk. So um, I'll hand over and stop sharing my screen, John. Great, thanks, um, Brendan. That was a great presentation. Um, and uh, I must admit, I got more out of your presentation than I did trying to read the paper. <laughs> I, found the, I found that summary a lot easier to understand. Thank you. Uh, but I do think it's important that, you know, again, we don't want to take our foot off um, being aware and, and looking out for these, this disease. But I think the main thing I took out of that when I read through it, and again, with your presentation, is that. Um, the disease is carried mechanically by the insects, not it doesn't breed within, it doesn't replicate within the insects. So you would have to travel 800 kilometres or whatever the distance is going to be in a wind with that virus remaining viable and ever how many of them would have to land on the same the same animal if those numbers are right. So again, you know, we don't want to be too relaxed about it, but uh, I certainly um, took a deep breath and um, and took some comfort out of the that um, executive summary as much as I could understand if it became too far too technical for me. OK, we have a number of questions um, that have come through. Um, we'll try and just get through these. We've only got a, a few minutes. Um, there's a question about vaccines. Um, one in particular, is there any existing vaccines available overseas and are we stockpiling them? I, I, you know, I think we've talked about this. We might just do that from a lumpy skin disease, first of all, and then from an um, uh, FMD disease. Um, I don't know who's best to handle that. Samantha, oh, is that might, really I might you? Ju jump in there, John, if you can hear me. So, Brent, Brent, thank so, you. so there are vaccines available for FMD um, and LSD. They're, they're slightly different vaccines. The LS, the FMD vaccine is an inactivated vaccine, um, and the LSD is a live attenuated vaccine. I won't go into too much detail where they act slightly differently, but they both have really good immunities and they work really well and they've been in place for some time. So we do have an arrangement where we have an FMD vaccine bank where we can access the antigen part. They can make up a vaccine and send it to us very quickly from the UK where they are stored. Um, and that can happen, ideally, the contract says seven days. Um, and so that can mobilise quite quickly. Noting that in the event of an outbreak, we're not. there's a whole lot of steps that would need to be in place. So. Ideally, if we can, you know, eradicate the disease quickly with with stamping out and management, that's certainly more desirable because that maintains our access to premium markets. As soon as you vaccinate, you lose that. Um, and so it, it is part of the suite of tools that we'd have 
we'd obviously look at the anything we would need as far as um, numbers um, and and we, we have arrangements with folks because um, depending on the need we could ramp up production and get access uh, on the LSD side um, we we are working through supply arrangements at the moment there are a number of um, providers that do have um, uh, large numbers of vaccine that we could draw from if we needed to uh, again similar sort of story we want to make sure that we um, don't sort of jump to vaccine it's not like covid or any other vaccines you can preemptively vaccine vaccinate people or vaccinate things to stop them getting disease in this case it's quite different because of the nature of trade and the nature of um, disease free status and vac vaccinations as soon as we vaccinate we lose those market access which is really important to note because that means you're not going to get that premium price um, or access to markets um, for for exports so we can't do it like you might do your clostridia or, or whatever it looks like if you sheep farmers you're not gonna we can't it doesn't work in the same sort of way so the best form of defense for us is all the stuff that we're doing offshore preventing the diseases coming in if in the event of an outbreak occurred we could use it but we've got a whole suite of measures that we could put in place beth did you want to add to any of that yeah. okay thank you um i think it is important to understand the way the trade protocols are written at the moment is that um, we would lose the majority of our markets overnight if we chose to preemptively vaccinate. Um, so that's not to say we can't change those protocols, but um, I think we might have mentioned in previous forums that any attempt to change those protocols will be a lengthy negotiation because the other parties and the other countries will want something out of it, um, as we would if they came to us on a similar basis. So it's um, it's not as simple as it may seem. Very specific question. Um, will everyone with a pick number be automatically posted to buy a security pack and draft plan? I think that one's aimed at you, Sam. Oh, Sam thanks, John. Look, oh, you, yes, can, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can. Great. Thank you. Yes. Look, I'm happy to answer that one. And I'm I'm sorry to say the answer to that would be no. But um, if people are looking for information, if you go to Animal Health Australia's website, we have so much information there for you. We've got things starting with fact sheets that are quick and easy to read. We've got OSVET plans if people want the really technical full detail about the diseases. And then for biosecurity planning, we have another website that we run in conjunction with Plant Health Australia and it's called Farm Biosecurity. And if you head over to there, again, there's everything that you might want. There's the most basic information for people that are starting you know from very little knowledge um, and there's videos there's fact sheets there's toolkits so that no matter what kind of property you have whether it's mixed farming or you've got one livestock species or um, you know whether you're just a, a plant producer you can use the tools there to um, work your way through to developing a biosecurity plan that's practical for your farm and um, and it should be easy you can you, there's steps there and, and you know it starts from very basic to really technical so I would encourage people to um, head over there you can do it anytime you like you can do it in stages thanks Sam thank you um, got a couple of questions again quite specific around the development of mRNA vaccine vaccinations for um, I don't know if that's relating to FMD as well as FN LSD, but I know the um, for those who are, might not be aware, the um, LSD vac um, virus has been taken into the Geelong facility, um, but I might let um, uh, Brendan or Brandt answer that. Is that? Beth, I'll flick to Beth on that one. On Beth, yep, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just um, I might just jump in. I think there was a couple of um, there's a couple of questions relating to mRNA, and I guess the first one and the most common one that we get asked is, does mRNA like would it, would the development of an mRNA vaccine change when we choose to vaccinate our population? Could it be used preemptively? Um, and the short answer to that is no. Um, John, as you just mentioned, um, our the sort of the, the the trade protocol. I'm talking about lumpy skin disease specifically here because that's where a lot of the focus has been on. Um, but the um, the international standards don't differentiate between different types of vaccines. If you vaccinate, then um, you 
um, lose your status as a lump and skin disease free country and therefore that comes with the trade implications. So that's the first part of the response. Um, that doesn't mean that um, down the track should a suitable vaccine be um, developed that has characteristics that, for example, um, allow you to um, you know, better differentiate between vaccinated and unvaccinated animals, a little bit like we see in foot and mouth disease vaccines, um, where you've got sort of different, different levels of freedom um, based on either freedom without vaccination, freedom with vaccination, um, or, um, um, or not free. Um, but that's a long path, John, as you've mentioned. You know, it does require sort of a, a, a lot of um, work internationally through standard setting bodies like the World Organization for Animal Health, um, and then at the bilateral level for trading partners to actually accept um, that position. So I'd say that's, that's one part of the answer. Um, the second sort of um, question I think that we've sort of seen come up is, has related to safety. Um, and of course, with the development of any new vaccine, and it's important for people to understand that there are currently no mRNA veterinary vaccines for livestock registered or approved under permit for sale or use in Australia. So this is a completely new thing. Um, that um, the regulatory authorities, and in this case, um, the APVMA, um, does have um, you know, very strict requirements around demonstrating safety and efficacy um, of that vaccine. So for example, um, you know, questions like the duration of immunity, um, the strength of that immunity, um, and the safety of the product, um, the, the safety for the animals, but the safety of the products as well. So it's quite a long path to development of new vaccines um, to actually be um, used within the population. Um, I encourage it absolutely. You know, I think you know, there, I think there's really exciting things that can be done with new vaccines. Um, but you know, we just have to understand that there is a you know a process um, that will be that will be gone through, and it won't be won't be very quick. Thank you. Um, so Brenda's given us an update on the, I haven't put a number on it, but um, obviously a reassessment of the probability of LSD in the next X number of years. Has there been any change to the um, probability of FMD over the next five years? I mean, the short answer is we haven't done the similar sort of work that, that we've done with Brendan on that space. Um, I guess what we could say though is, if you look at it, I, I guess more simply that the, the number of cases has certainly decreased. So if you look at the epidemiological curve, there's a lot of animals that have been infected, a lot of vaccinations that have been provided. So it's probably on the down slope, but, but as we talk about the tail of the epi curve is, is going to be fairly sort of long and persistent. So definitely the risk has decreased when it was really rampant. So you had a whole lot of novel animals, so they hadn't been infected, it was spreading quickly. We did know the extent of it, um, which is why we reacted quite strongly. Um, and so we've put those border measures in place, which is which are there at the moment. The, the pre-border work that, that Beth talked about and the post-border work around the preparatory work is still there. So, I mean, you could say that it has decreased, but to what extent we don't have figures or numbers like what Brendan produced. Um, but, it, but it certainly has come down a bit and it's likely that Indonesia will probably transform over time into treated like we would another endemic country. The difference is that it's closer in proximity. We do have numbers of people coming in and out of Bali, et cetera, which is why we haven't changed our border settings um, since that time. And we need to do so very, very carefully. We need to do risk assessments. We need to do a whole series of things so we don't sort of turn it on and off quickly. We, we make sure that we do the work, um, do the risk assessments before making any decisions. And no decisions have been made about any of that at this stage. Thank you. Um, look, we are a bit over time, but I'll just do a couple more, more questions. Um, there is one, um, one relating to what the budget's going to hold um, in terms of biosecurity funding. Um, obviously, anyone who knows isn't going to say, and anyone who doesn't know is only guessing, uh, but uh, uh, the minister has, <laughs> has given me a couple of assurances that um, that there'll be something in the budget for it. Uh, I think consistent with probably this current government's approach, it will be user pay to a large extent. 
uh, we're certainly encouraging to spread that burden across all those, um, the whole of the, all the taxpayers out of the public good that arises from it, and also where those risks arise. Um, obviously, passengers coming in from overseas you know, at this stage don't directly contribute to that. So look, we are pushing for those sort of things, but I'm not going to put any of the um, the people in the department on the spot and ask them to reveal what they uh, what they might know. OK, um, so there's a little bit of a concern about um, the inconsistency of state legislation and state approaches. Um, how confident are we that um, that different states will handle this in the same way um, and have the capacity to respond? That might be for Sam. Yep, thank you. Thanks, John. I think I can answer that and give people a bit of confidence in that saying we've got the Ausstat plans there. They are the nationally agreed response plan that we'll use for lumpy skin disease or foot and mouth. And there's actually a whole range that cover a lot of diseases and they're pre-agreed and it takes away that uncertainty. It means that if the disease is diagnosed anywhere in Australia, everybody knows exactly what we're going to do straight away and we basically follow that plan. There is flexibility there if there is some really strange different situation that pops up, but it should give people confidence that it's already been discussed at length. Um, and if people want to have a look at the OSFET plans, they're on the AHA website and we're actually really proud. We've worked hard with industry and the governments to get both of those OSFET plans updated. Uh, they were published end of 2022. We did a little desktop exercise on the lumpy skin disease one at the end of 2022 and we've identified some more improvements for that. And the foot and mouth disease one is also undergoing an improvement process, which we hope to have finished within the next couple of months. So we're always looking at them. We're always trying to improve them. And that's what we'll use first. Um, the minute, you know, we have strong suspicion or diagnosis of any exotic disease. And I might just um, quickly add to that, John, just very quickly, because I know we're running out of time. This is discussed right up the line to NBC, our National Biosecurity Committee. Um, there is a lot of goodwill around cohesion in this space and the need to have a nationally agreed approach. Um, and so right up the line in the highest echelons of, of the relevant agricultural departments right across the country, there is that strong commitment and that's been as contemporary as, as the last NBC. So I think you can, people can be rest, rest assured that that's in everyone's best interest to work together. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Sam. Um, look, it is, um, we've got about 10 minutes over time and I know it's been, we've got a few people dropping off, so we'll probably have about a quarter drop off. So we'll probably draw it to a, a conclusion at that point. Thanks everyone for your time. Thanks particularly to the presenters for uh, great presentations and uh, taking the time and effort out of uh, on an evening to, to inform the industry. And again, thank you to NFF for um, facilitating this and, um, and we look forward to um, another update at some point when we think it's relevant. But in the meantime, please reach out and ask any questions that you want. And again, please put that number in your phone. Thanks very much. Thanks for hosting, John. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.